to look at your neighbor and say, smile, it won't hurt you. <laughs> Praise God, I love this church. Didn't you enjoy those teenagers singing? Man, that was great. I got fired up listening to those kids sing. And one of them was smiling at me when she was singing. I love that. What a blessing. I'm so happy to have my wife with me tonight. Some lady out here said, where are your brothers? I said, my wife's here. She said, but I don't want you here without your brothers. <laughs> Listen, I love my brothers, but I can only take poquito of them. <laughs> so I'm with my wife. I love being with her in meetings, and we're on the road. This is the 47th church uh, that I've preached in since the end of May. Uh, we're on the road, and man, have we traveled the country 25,000 miles and back and forth across the country. But I want to tell you something. Hear me careful. I've preached in Texas and New Orleans and, and Ohio and Michigan and all over the East Coast and Middle West. Um, but I'm telling you, there's no churches in this country like the churches in California. I mean what I said. I get absolutely fired up. People say, oh, there's no good churches in California. Uh, everybody's out there weird. And, uh, and I look at them and say, look who's talking. I mean it. And uh, Brother Burton, it's good to see you back there and your precious wife. Missionaries just walked in the house. Let's give them a hand of welcome. Amen. Amen. I love the Burtons. And... Uh, Boy, I want to tell you, he's a hero, great missionary. Glad to see you, my brother. And, uh, but I'm so happy to be here. I love your preacher. He is a wonderful friend. I thank God for him. He brought me in. Brother Valdez took me to barbecue yesterday. Why are you sitting down front? This is... You, yeah, the altar is right there, man. Uh, but uh, I, we had such a wonderful time yesterday. I got to preach to the teenagers today in the school. And church, you are to be commended. You've got a great Christian school. And happy, I walked down the hallway and all those little happy faces. And uh, most of them, most of them, uh, you know, smart, I think. <laughs> I did the preacher's class. Is that what it was? Preacher's class yesterday. And man, I had a time. And uh, just enjoyed being in there. Uh, but I appreciate the opportunity to be here tonight. Go in your Bibles, please. Two passages. Let's go to Psalm 26. And then we'll go to 1 Corinthians chapter number 11. Pardon my voice. I'm fighting some kind of something in the throat <clears throat> since I came here. There's, I don't know what it is. It might be the L.A. pollution floating down here. Uh, but we're, we're certainly thankful to be here. And uh, God bless you. We love this church. What a wonderful place. Thank you, preacher. First Corinthians chapter number 11 and Psalm 26. I want you to see just one verse in Psalm 26. And uh, we're going to teach the whole chapter tonight, Psalm 26. But I want you to see verse number 2. Would you please? There are three words in this verse that are synonyms. As well, they're the key to the chapter. Notice verse number two. David says, examine me, O Lord, and prove me. Try my reins and my heart. How many can identify the three synonyms? Raise your hand. Let's say them out loud. Here we go. Examine, prove, try. All three of those words mean, David says, God, I want you to know my heart. Now go to 1 Corinthians chapter number 11. Keep your marker there in uh, Psalm 26. In 1 Corinthians 11, you know this passage, as often as you serve the Lord's Supper, I guess I've served the Lord's Supper hundreds of times over these 31 years of pastoring, and I guess I could probably read this from, from memory, or recite this from memory, but I want to scan it. Uh, the Apostle Paul says in verse 23, I've received of the Lord that which also I delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus the same night in which he was betrayed took bread when he had given thanks. He broke it and said, Take eat, this is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. Then he did the same with a cup. And he said it again, This do, drink it in remembrance of me. And then verse 26 is an important verse in the chapter. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. And so there's a reason for the Lord's Supper. We serve the Lord's Supper, one of the two ordinances of the church, which follows baptism. He said, we do this to remember Jesus. How many think that's important? Say amen. amen. 
He said, do this as oft as ye do it in remembrance of me. And to remember his death till he come. But he goes on in verse number 28. And I want everybody to read it out loud with me. Verse number 28 of 1 Corinthians 11. Ready? Here we go. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. I want to speak tonight on the subject self-examination. How important self-examination is. And I hope tonight, if the Lord could speak to your heart about the import of this thought that God gives us the prerogative and he gives us the means by which we could really have a true self-examination. I think it'd keep us all out of a lot of trouble. I think it'd keep us from making foolish decisions. I think it'd keep us perhaps on the straight and narrow as time goes on. Let's pray together. Father, I want to thank you for allowing me uh, to be here. Thank you for this great church. I pray that God you'd use my time in the pulpit to be a help uh, to the Faith Baptist Church. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Psalm 26 is a chapter that David wrote. Some mistakenly place Psalm 26 around the time of David's sin with Bathsheba, but that's not correct. As best we can estimate, Psalm 26 is a response of David when uh, after King Saul was killed, one of the sons of Saul, Ishabeth, he was assassinated. And David had nothing to do with that. You remember the life of David. David was very serious about touching the Lord's anointed. Now he had ample reason and ample opportunity to have killed Saul because Saul tried to kill David a number of times. But David was restrained himself. And the one time that he cut the bottom of his coat or his cloak, it grieved David. And David understood that Saul was God's assignment to Israel. And so David would not touch King Saul. When Ishabesh was killed, David was very certain that he didn't do it. And he said, God, examine me. Know me. Try me. I didn't kill him. That's what Psalm 26 is about. He's examining himself and looking at his behavior. But let's move forward, if we may, just a little bit in his life. David is now firmly seated as king. The kingdom is growing, flourishing. There's peace in the country. And there are some wars. Uh, but David has sent Joab out in excursions against the enemies of God. And especially the Philistines. And one particular day, David is up on his housetop. And he goes, uh, and by the way, just so you understand, houses, there were flat. Uh, you could go to Palestine and Israel today and you'd see all the houses are flat. And usually there's a walking place on top of the house. And, and uh, so David is there in his palace. And if you could see the historic site of the king's palace, otherwise David's home, you'd notice that it was looking down on the city of Jerusalem. And this was, of course, prior to the temple uh, being built. That wasn't built in David's time. Uh, but David goes on that housetop, stay with the thought, and he looks down and he sees a woman bathing. He sees Bathsheba. And I've always found that a little bit interesting. She's taking a bath. Her name is Bathsheba. I just never understood the humor there. Uh, I don't think it's intended. But he looks and he sees that woman taking a bath. Now listen, it wasn't a sin that he looked. She was there. Uh, we could talk about the implications of that. But David looked again, and he looked again, and soon in his heart, lust uh, was uh, uh, running amok. And now he sends for her. You do what the king says. So Bathsheba comes to David. And uh, her husband at the time was out fighting with Joab. And he was doing what a good man does. He was doing what an honorable man does. He was doing what a man does. He was fighting for his country. But she comes to David. David seduces her and commits adultery with Bathsheba. She leaves the palace, goes back to her house. In a short time thereafter, weeks or we don't know, she sends word to King David, Sir, I am with child, with your child. David then in response, he sends for Joab. Joab comes. He says, Joab, you get Uriah the Hittite. You bring him off the front lines. I need to see him. 
He sends Uriah home. Can you imagine this good man, this godly man, this just man, this righteous man? He comes into the king's palace by way of his suggestion that you do what the king says. And, jo uh, and Uriah comes and King David says, listen, I, I appreciate what you've been doing. I want you to go home and be with your wife. And I want you to be with her in a husband and wife way. And you spend some time on holiday here. I want you out of the battle. I want to reward you with time with your wife. But that man was a good man and he was an honorable man and a decent man and he went to sleep on the doorpost of his house he would not go in to his wife which was his natural right he didn't do it so somebody sent word to King David and said King uh, Uriah didn't sleep in his house he slept on the front porch he said, bring him to me. And can you imagine that man walking back in? He's a man of good character and, and honor and valor. And he comes before the king. And the king says, listen, I told you to go be with your wife. He said, sir, I can't be with my wife when my brethren are in harm's way. And so David now, he's an adulterer. He's also a deceiver. And now he's going to become a wine bibber. He gives that man drink and gets him drunk. And gets him so drunk that he stumbles his way home. He says, go be with your wife. And that good man still wouldn't do it. And David had no other option. He was up against the wall. He decided, I guess I'm going to have to do something drastic. He sends word to Joab. He says, I'm sending Uriah back to you. And listen to me, Joab. Bring Uriah to the hottest spot in the battle. Set him on the front line. Put him in the greatest, uh, 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 worst position possible. And when he's there and the battle is the worst, you call all of his comrades in arms out and leave him there. And in effect, David now becomes a murderer. He absolutely is an adulterer. He's a deceiver. He's a, a man. Woe to him that giveth his neighbor to drink. And now he's a murderer. And I want to ask you a question tonight. What if David would have stopped? That day when he looked down on that rooftop and just thought to himself, what am I about to do to my life? Right. Amen. What if he had just stopped and thought, dear God, what am I about to do to my precious family and to the name of my father? What am I about to do? Self-examination could have saved the day. That's right. That's right. But he went headlong in. There are two women in the Bible. Philippians chapter 3 lists them. Eodas and Synthike, they're in heaven tonight. Those two women wished that their names weren't in the Bible. As a matter of fact, if those two women would have thought about the fuss that they were having, about the fact that they couldn't get over something, and they kept jawing at one another and flapping their mouths at one another until the Apostle Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, had to say, I beseech Eodas and Syntyche that they be of the same mind in the Lord. If they'd have just had a moment of pause... They could have thought, man, do I want my name put in the eternal, forever, eternal word of God and walking around heaven forever? Aren't you Yodis? Yes, I'm Yodis! <laughs> Think about the power of self-examination. If Peter would have just thought about the fact that he was in the wrong position, hanging around the wrong people. If he'd have just had a time of introspection, he wouldn't have heard the cock crow. I'm saying to you tonight, every one of us, every one of us, need to exercise the virtue and the privilege of self-examination. Can I hear it? Amen. amen. Oh, David was a man after God's own heart. At least you think I'm throwing stones at him tonight. I'm not. But he gives us in Psalm 26 a tremendous pattern, a guide, if I could say, a guide, a blueprint for self-examination. Let's look at what he teaches us, shall we? Are you in the 26th chapter of Psalm? Say amen. amen. Notice verse number one. Let's just go right down the line here and we'll see what the Holy Spirit gave David for us. First of all, he says in verse number one, he says, Judge me, O Lord, for I have walked in mine integrity. I have trusted also in the Lord, therefore I shall not slide. I find, first of all, David teaches us here that there needs to be a self-examination of our walk. It's what he says, I have walked in mine integrity. And when we're talking about the word integrity, let's consider what that means. The word integrity is the quality of being honest. It's a state of being. Integrity is to be whole or uh, uh, without division, undivided. David teaches us here that I have to have an honest walk in life. Look at me, listen to me. You need to be an honest person. 
We need to quit telling lies. Say amen. amen. We need to quit living a lie. We need to have a life undivided. There is nothing more damaging in the house of God and our testimony in our communities than hypocrites. I'm not saying you, you know your heart. I'm nobody to tell you anything. But Lord in heaven, help us have a singular heart. God, give us truthful hearts. Amen. A walk of, of integrity. Are you honest tonight? Are you an honest person? When I married that woman 33 years ago, I said I do. And I, I've done my best to never have deceit in my life. And I'm talking about deceit even on, on these kind of things right here. And things that we say and things that we do. We need to be honest people. Everybody needs to be honest. You know, April 1st is an odd holiday in our country. There's a fellow in our church up in Manteca. He's a good man. But they got married on April 1st. That's the oddest, oddest anniversary I ever heard. Every April 1st, I send him the same text. I can't believe you did it. That's just what I send him. John, I can't believe you did it. Got married on April 1st. But you might not know it. April 30th is also a national holiday. April 1st is April Fool's Day. But April 30th is National Honesty Day. You didn't know that, did you? Let's put it on the school calendar, amen? National Honesty Day. The fellow that established that, his name was Goldberg, uh, Hirsch Goldberg, and he said, it seems to me a country like ours ought to have on the foolish month, we ought to end the month on a higher moral note. And so he's the one that introduced uh, the National Honesty Day. And listen, for a Christian, we're supposed to be honest all the time. We're supposed to tell the truth. Look at me, listen to me. Just stop lying. That's right. yeah. Cut it out. Yeah, you see, it's not that easy. Yes, it is. When I was a boy, my mother sat me down. She had one of those mom and son talks. And she said, now, Eric, you know, son, uh, I want to talk to you. I said, yes, mom. She said, son, I just want to give you some advice. Don't lie. I said, yes, ma'am. And she said, no, you don't understand. You're a terrible liar. <laughs> she said, your brother Russell, expert liar. She said, Russell can lie and, and, and honestly convince even his mother. But son, you are the worst liar of my six children. And she said, my advice to you is just don't be a liar. And so I've taken that advice into life. And uh, I don't know if it was a compliment or not. But the truth be told, everybody in this place, we need to examine our walk. Is it an honest walk? Listen, you can't be a double lifer in this church. You cannot be a double lifer as a Christian. It doesn't work. When you signed up as Christian, when you signed your line and said, I am a child of God, you've got to live and walk in honesty. Let me move along. Notice verse number 3 in Psalm 26. Here's the next thing he tells us we need to examine. So the first one is I need to examine my walk in integrity. And verse number 3 brings us the next one. As I read it, let's see if you can figure it out. He says, For thy loving kindness is before mine eyes, and I have walked in thy truth. What I see in verse number 3 is we need to examine our motivation. Thy loving kindness is before mine eyes. I want to ask you tonight, what motivates you as a Christian? What motivates you? What's motivating you in your spiritual walk? What's motivating you in your bus ministry? What's motivating you uh, in your Sunday school class? You see, he said, David said, Thy loving kindness walks ahead of me. Thy loving kindness is before mine eyes. And I have walked in thy truth. Listen to me, church. The greatest motivation in the life of the child of God is just look at how good God is. Amen. Look at his goodness. Say amen, church. Amen. He has been really, really good to you. How many here are from what we would call a third world nation? Raise your hands. You're from a third world nation. Just a few, I'm surprised. Uh, uh, in, in our country, we are so blessed. We are so blessed. And David says, I want my motivation to be examined. God, you've been good to me. Hey, listen to me. I don't care how bad it is. I don't care how difficult it might be. God has been good to us. Nahum chapter 1 and verse number 7. The Lord is good. A stronghold in the day of trouble. Oh, I want to tell you, when you get uh, down in the dumps and you start thinking about uh, how hard it is, won't you run to the goodness of God and be reminded how faithful He is. David said, Thy loving kindness is before mine eyes. And I'm telling you right now, when you start looking at how good God is, looking at how good God is, I'm a little tired of the news and a little tired of all the stuff being said. And listen, I was in a school today where there was uh, over a hundred 
good kids. Amen. I'm telling you something. These are precious kids that carry their Bibles and know they're not perfect. But oh, there's some wonderful things going on. And I can tell you firsthand experience around this country, there's some great things going on in America. Amen. And wonderful things. And great young preachers. I'm talking about millennial preachers. Guys that are in their 20s and 30s that aren't bending and changing with the winds of the day. Hey, I'm glad how good God is. Amen. Examine the goodness of God. Maybe you ought to go home tonight and put on your refrigerator Nahum 1.7 and be reminded all day long the goodness of the Lord. Well, he goes on. Let's continue in verses 4 through 5. Now, I'm going to read it, but I think you can figure out uh, what we're supposed to examine here. He says in verse 4, I have not sat with vain persons, neither will I go in with dissemblers. I have hated the congregation of evildoers and will not sit with the wicked. You figured it out, I'm sure, that word hated there in that verse. Verse number five, I was in the airport some time ago, and uh, actually I was coming out of the parking lot of the airport. It seems like I'm in airports a lot, and parking lots a lot these days. But as I was coming out, I gave a lady a gospel track. I said, lady, here's the best news you'll read in your life. And she said, what is it? I said, it's a message from the Bible. And she said, I don't want that. She did literally threw it right back at me. I said, hold it. Why'd you do that? She said, that Bible is full of hate and murder. And she said, I don't want nothing to do with hate and murder. And I said, lady, you don't understand God. God hates sin. God hates your sin. In fact, God made a hell for sinners, but he said his only begotten son to die in your place so you wouldn't have to go to hell. So the God that hates that much, he loves that much, and he'd save you if you'd let her. Listen to me, that word hate's important there. And why am I saying that? Because there ought to be some things you and I hate. I know that's not popular Joel Olstein preaching. Because you're not looking at Mr. Joel. Amen. I got better hair than him anyways, but uh, what I'm talking about is we need to have a self-examination, you figure it out, of our associations. That's, right. Amen. That's what those two verses are teaching. He says, that God, he says, I've not sat with vain persons. He talks about dissemblers. He says, I've hated the congregation of evildoers, and I will not sit with the wicked. Does that kind of remind you a little bit of Psalm chapter 1, verse number 1? Blessed is a man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. Amen. You see, walking, standing, sitting in that verse. Walking, standing, sitting. You're never to be in either of those perspectives with the wicked. You say, well, what am I supposed to do with the wicked? The goal of the Christian is to win everybody that's lost to Christ. Amen. That's why we have friendship with the world, to win them to Christ. But oh, we need to examine our associations. How about this one? Write it down, please. Psalm 119 and verse 63. What a verse. Here's what it says. I am a companion of all them that fear thee and of them that keep thy precepts. Parents, take that and make your kids memorize those verses. Put it on the walls of their rooms. Get stupid Michael Jordan down and put scriptures back on the walls. Say amen. I didn't mean to say the word stupid in the pulpit, but bless God, we need to get back to putting the Bible on our walls at home. How's, how's this verse? Grandparents, get this one down. You need to teach your grandchildren this one. Jeremiah 15, 17. This one will poke you in the eye. Listen to what it says. Jeremiah 15, 17. I sat not in the assembly of the mockers, nor rejoiced. I sat alone because of thy hand, for thou hast filled me with indignation. There comes a time that you have to sit alone. When you examine your associations. I, I'm, I'm not here to pick at anybody, but listen to me. You need to be careful of your friends. Uh, and your Facebook friends. Your little Facebook friends got their little wine goblets and they're, they're uh, toasting one another. You want that kind of friend? Is that what you're after? Listen, by children of God, woe to him that giveth this neighbor to drink. We, didn't, we don't need to have any of that business in our Christian fellowship. And, and we see them all the time, don't we? It's kind of like the real people come out on Facebook. I don't understand what it is, but they think that the pastor doesn't see that, and the church leaders don't see that, and the youth pastor doesn't see that. I think it's their way of saying, this is the real me. Well, honey, if that's the real you, I'm not going there. Right. I'm not going to be a companion of evildoers. I'm saying we need to have a self-examination of our associations. You know how easy it is to get rid of a bad or a poor 
Facebook friend, I'm told you can just click them right out. <laughs> I was preaching in Indianapolis, Indiana, a good church. This is a millennial preacher. He's, uh, he's uh, 31 years old. And then I'm going to tell you, he is a smart, sharp cookie. And a good church right in, in right down the road from the, the racetrack. And uh, uh, I was preaching in the Sunday school hour. I did the, 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 uh, the youth class. This church is about 85 or 90. And there's a boy in that church by the name of Kyle. And he's, uh, he stands about this tall to me. And, uh, but the top of his hair, I'm not kidding you, is this tall. <laughs> That's no joke. It's a stovepipe on top of his head. I mean, it's up there. It literally is that deep on top of his head. And it's, it's perfect. It's like somebody took a head trimmer and just, it was perfect. And uh, he's just a sweet black boy in the church, a black young man. And, uh, and I, I got to sit with him after, after Sunday school. And uh, he sat, and, and I don't know why this was. It grieves me. Hey, Brother Burton's good to see you, man. It, it grieves me that, that he, he sat here by himself. He's a bus kid. And he sat all by himself. It just, it just bothered me the whole time I was preaching. Why isn't somebody getting around this kid? Uh, but anyways, I sat down with him. And I said, Kyle, I'm going to ask you uh, your story. I said, are you saved? He said, yes, I got saved in this church. I said, man, that's great. And he told me a little bit about it. I said, you get baptized? He said, I got baptized right there. And I said, man, you're saved. You're baptized. How old are you? 16, he said. I said, you're in public school, right? He said, yes. You drove the bus? He said, yes. I said, your parents come? He said, no, it's just me. And I said, well, tell me about your school. I said, I want you to name me five of your friends at school, five kids that you hang out with. And he rattled off five names just like that. And I said, I'm going to ask you some personal questions about your friends now, Kyle. I said, I'm going to ask you about each of them, and I want to know, is he a good influence or a poor influence? He said, okay. So I remembered the name of the first one, and I called his name. I said, is he a good influence or poor? He said, he's poor. I said, tell me how he's a poor influence. And he told me, he said, well, pastor, he said, every day, and he named his name. He said, every day on the way to school, he's got a marijuana cigarette, and he's 16 now, and he smokes a little bit of it, and then after school, on the way home, he smokes the rest of it. I said, you walk with him? He said, yeah, I walk with him. I'm in school with him every day. I said, Kyle, I'm going to ask you a tough one now. Have you ever smoked with him? He said, I have. Watch me now. He said, I don't do it anymore. Amen. That's, that's good right there. I'll try it again. I don't do it anymore. Amen. See, you follow me here. And then I said, all right, how about your next friend? He said, well, the next one's... Kind of two. He said, they're both the same. I said, all right, what about them? Good influence or poor influence? And he said, well, they're poor. And I said, what's, why are they poor influence? And he said, well, these two guys after school, they always go and they find a place where they hide beer. And then they drink the beer and that's what they do every day. He said, they have beer. I said, where do they get it? He said, well, I think they get it from their dad and their older brother. I said, okay, I'm asking another tough question. I said, have you drunk that stuff with him? He said, yeah, I have a lot of times. And I said, are you still doing that? He said, I don't do it anymore. Amen. Come on, stay with me, church. Amen. See, I'm, I'm telling you something. That's what we're after. You said, I don't want those kids around. Listen, we can help those kids. That's right. He said, I don't do that anymore. He was very emphatic with his hands, and I love it. I can see it in my mind. I said, how about number four? Tell me about him. He said, well, he's a poor influence. He called his name. I said, what's he do? Why, why is he a poor influence? He said, every day on the way to school and on the way home from school, he looks at pornography all the time. He said he walks and looks at pornography all the way to school, 16 church, and all the way. By the way, your kids have internet on this thing. You watch those kids. I said, you watch those kids. If they have internet, they have pornography. Absolute fact. And I said, all right, Kyle, I'm going to ask you, son, have you looked at that stuff with him? He said, I have quite a few times. I, and I said, what about now? He said, I don't do it anymore. Amen. Oh, I was so happy. I said, what about your fifth friend? He said, well, he's a good boy. He's, he's what I call a church friend. I said, really? I said, tell me. He said, yeah, he goes to a church, and I go to my church, and he's always inviting me to his, and I'm always inviting him to mine, and I've never gone to his, and he's never come to mine, but every time we're together, we talk about church. 
So here's a boy in an independent Baptist church, Indianapolis, Indiana, a good boy, saved boy, baptized boy. Four out of five friends are bad associations, and there's not much he can do it. But here's the only thing he's got going. He's got that church right there in Indianapolis that loves him, picks him up on a bus every week. I said every week. Brings him in, has a Sunday school, has people that love him and need to love him more. I'm just telling you something. Somehow or another, these kids are going to make it. An evil association is what's killing our kids. I asked Kyle before I got done talking to him, I said, what about your dad? Does your dad uh, approve your friends? And he said, well, I don't know because my dad has been in prison four years and he'll be there another 20 years. And so, folks, I know that brings it right home to us. We realize that our cities are full of those kind of things. But beyond that, listen to me, even in churches like this, we have got to examine our associations. God help us get that. I'm going to rattle through the next one. Notice verse number 6. Verse number 6. I'm just teaching what David said about examining and proving and trying. He said, first judge my walk. He said, second, judge my, uh, my motivation. Uh, next, he said, I need to examine my associations. And then verse number six, he says in verse six, I will wash mine hands in innocency. So will I come past thine altar, O Lord. There we realize, he says, I need to examine my confession of sin. My confession of sin. He says in verse six, I will wash my hands in innocency and come past the altar. When you put those two images together, he is detailing that we need to examine how we are confessing sin. Listen to me, church. We need to have a regular examination of what's going on in our corrupt heart. And we need to hit the altar and call out our sin to God and say, God, forgive me. Confession of sin. He, uh, John, 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sin, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But I'm afraid we're better at, uh, at quoting that verse than doing that verse. Confessing our sin. Bringing it before God. Listen, there's too much sin in our homes these days. I ask you, are our, sin, are our homes in general more holy today than they were 35 years ago? Generally speaking, I don't believe so. We let stuff in our homes through the television. And I'm not trying to get over on a rabbit trail here, but the fact is, stuff that we would have never done, we're allowing in our homes today. It's rampant, church. I'm on the road. I frankly don't have a TV now. I, uh, my wife and I, so I can preach against TV, see? <laughs> but honestly, I'm telling you honestly, because I don't have a, a, an input of television all the time, and it's been, it's been almost four, uh, six months. I put on a television now, and I am telling you honestly, I am appalled at what I see. Amen. Right. It blows my mind. And I go, click. I say to her, I can't watch this thing anymore. Amen. Somebody said to me the other day, they're talking about the virtues of Rush Limbaugh. You know why I don't like him? Because he cusses! Yeah, right. yeah. Amen. You say, but he's right on. Listen to me. We are Christians. Right. Amen. We are God's people. We are his peculiar treasure. We have the Holy Ghost living in us. And for God's good name, we ought to hit the altar and say, Lord, I've got a cold heart. I've got a carnal heart. I've got sin in my home. My father, uh, he got saved in 1970. And uh, 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 he was a drunk. I can remember it in, in our home, a stack of pornography next to his chair. It's the way it was, 1970, 69. And uh, dad got saved. And uh, man, I'm telling you something, that home changed. I mean, he, sn he sniffed out everything. And uh, he said to my mother one day, he said, I want to talk to you about, mom told us this later, we got older, uh, about the Montgomery and Ward catalog. How many remember Montgomery and Wards? That was many years ago. Or Sears and Roebuck, remember that? And dad, dad said to mom, three boys now, he said, honey, there are pictures in that magazine I don't want in my house. And guess what? He ripped them out. Amen. Listen to me. I know that's, that's anti. Listen, we, we didn't have a television when I was a kid, and Dad got one. After he got saved, he got rid of it, and somebody gave him one. And uh, I, I was sitting in the house with Darren and Russell, and uh, 
uh, we didn't have a TV for a long time after that got saved. Now we have one. Woo! And some of you are going to think this is nuts. But we're sitting there watching TV and Gilligan's Island is on. And here comes Ginger and Mary Ann. And me, Darren, and Russ are like... <laughs> we didn't know it, but just down the hallway was Dad. And he's watching it. And all of a sudden we heard... <clears throat> And he said, uh, you boys liking what you're watching? And what are we going to say? Uh, yes, sir. And we did. Yes, sir. He said, I thought so. And he went and unplugged it, got rid of it, brought a record player home from the pawn shop, set it up, put the old Kingston, Kingsman Quartet on there. He said, that's what we'll do from now on. I'm trying to tell you, church, that we've got to have an examination. Is there worminess and sin in our hearts? Don't fool yourself into thinking, well, look at me. I got the right haircut. I'm carrying a King James Bible. I got the Thark Brothers CD in the player, which, by the way, is available tonight <laughs> after the service. <laughs> How was that for a segue? <laughs> Need to have an examination of our sin. Isaiah 1, 16 through 18. Write it down. Isaiah chapter 1, verses 16 through 18. Then Psalm 51, verses 1 through 4. Have mercy on me, O God. That's what David said after his sin. According to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity, cleanse me from my sin. We need to have an examination of our confession. Verse 7, he gives us another one, just a couple more. In verse 7 he says that I may publish, get that word publish, there's your key word, publish with the voice of thanksgiving and tell, and tell all thy wondrous works. You know, we're supposed to examine how our witness is going. You're not breathing air just to have a happy life. No, no, we're breathing air to help get people out of hell and into heaven. And we've got to constantly examine how are we doing that today. I took a run today up near the Walmart around the parking lot, and I saw two women at 8 o'clock in the morning pulling their little buggy with uh, the Jehovah's Witness material sitting at a bus stop, and there they sat, two of them. And all day long gave out uh, uh, heretical information. And I thought to myself as I saw that happening, dear God, put a fire under your church again. Get us where we carry gospel tracts again and get the message out and be witnesses. We need to examine our witnessing. Uh, just a couple more next. Look at verse number 8. You know this was coming. Look at, Lord, I have loved the habitation of thy house and the place where thine honor dwelleth. Obviously, we need to have an examination of our faithfulness. Faithfulness. We need to look at this thing. Our pitiful, pitiful excuses. They just don't hold water. How many remember that song? Excuses, excuses. You hear them every day. I got a quart of milk in the refrigerator, the song says. That's why I can't go to church. I'll examine our faithfulness. Two scriptures to write down, please. Psalm 27, 4. One thing have I desired of the Lord that I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. Hebrews 10, 25. Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. Then finally, verses 11 and 12 of the text chapter. Look at it, please. But as for me, I will walk in mine integrity. Redeem me and be merciful unto me. Look at verse 12. My foot standeth in an even place. We need to have an examination of our steadfastness. Look at this. In this day, we need to be steadfast. Not moving around. We're here. We're not budget, steadfast. We need steadfast men and women and teenagers, teenage girls, teenage boys, uh, sticking with it. First Corinthians 15, 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable. Amen. And finally, let me close with this. There needs to be an examination of your salvation. Amen. Nobody knows if you're saved. Are you hearing me? Nobody knows. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 13, 5, examine yourselves. Whether you be in the faith, prove your own selves. Know ye not your own, know ye your own, not your own selves how that Christ died for you except ye be reprobates. Nobody knows if you're saved, but you know right here. Right. And I want to tell you something, there's something deep inside. Someone asked me, if you doubt your salvation, does it mean you're lost? No, it doesn't mean that. Sometimes doubt causes you to seek. And I say this, if you're doubting your salvation, get the answer. Get it settled. Don't live in doubt. Satan will triple you, cripple you through doubt. But if you're not saved, you know it in your heart. Be saved because there's a hell, a real hell. Examine yourselves. Many years ago, my brother, Darren, his wife, Star, was holding Hannah. Hannah was seven. And Hannah was on her lap. And you know how parents love on kids and 
she was just rubbing Hannah's arms and she got down here and got down on her calf and she felt a large lump and she pulled up her, her, uh, her skirt there and she felt that I didn't mean to show my legs just now but anyways she felt it and it was hot and she said to Darren she said I don't know what this is but it doesn't feel right long story short it was a cancerous tumor it was just about ready to pierce into the bone had it gone any further she'd have probably had bone marrow cancer the doctors said you finding that made all the difference wouldn't it be great if the Holy Spirit went on something in your life tonight let's bow our heads together please Father in heaven we thank you for your word